Sometimes lawyers misuse their client information. This could be in the form of insider trading, making stock purchases or sales based on something secret that they learned while working on a client's matter. Or it could be acting on information they got from one client to get a strategic advantage for another client who maybe the lawyer favors. Sometimes this is even to the disadvantage of the original client. We have a rule that covers this, ABA Model Rule 1.8b, and that's what we're going to be talking about here. I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is for my professional responsibility class. Let's dive in. This is one of our conflicts of interest rules, as I said, under 1.8, and we're talking about information related to the representation. And the text of the rule itself says, a lawyer shall not use information relating to the representation of a client to the disadvantage of the client, unless the client gives informed consent, except as permitted or required by these rules. Now, I want to draw your attention to a few specifics here that you should keep in mind for test questions, especially multiple choice questions that you might encounter on the MPRE. Notice that it says any information related to the representation. This actually covers more than just your direct communications with the client or what the client tells you. In that sense, it's broader than, say, attorney-client privilege, because this could cover information that the lawyer gleans, let's say, from interviewing other witnesses or um, reading different files or reviewing government reports uh, about the client, government files, and so forth. Note that it says, except as permitted or required by these rules. What's that talking about? Well, we have a rule we get to later in my course about candor to the tribunal or candor to the court. In other words, if a judge asks you a question point blank, puts you on the spot, you have to answer truthfully, even though that um, would be to the disadvantage of your client. Um, also, if acting pursuant to a court order is an exception that we'll encounter later. And there are exceptions for court orders and self-preservation under the confidentiality rule 1.6. Now, um, for example, sometimes if a lawyer has to sue a client for fees or the client sues the lawyer for legal malpractice after the representation is over, the lawyer may have to reveal information, uh, confidential information about the representation in order to defend himself or may have to do this in order to avoid being charged as an accomplice in a client's crimes. So that's an exception. Those exceptions to 1.6 would also apply to 1.8b. Also note that it says, unless you have the client gives informed consent, watch out for that, pay close attention to exam hypos, because if the client gives consent to the lawyer acting on the information, even if it's to the disadvantage of the client, then um, the lawyer would not be subject to discipline. Now, comment five really unpacks this rule here. It starts by saying that the rule is based on the lawyer's duty of loyalty to the client. And paragraph B applies when the information is used to benefit either the lawyer or a third person, such as another client or business associate of the lawyer. So watch out for complex hypotheticals where the lawyer takes information from one client and basically discloses it to another client or gives the other client advice that they only could have given based on knowing that private information. And they give an example. Let's say a lawyer learns that a client intends to purchase and develop several parcels of uh, uh, attached land. Maybe they want to put in a mall or a shopping center or a subdivision. The lawyer can't use that information to purchase one of the parcels in competition with the client or to recommend that another client make such a purchase. I hope you can see what's going on here. The concern is that if you know that your client intends to buy 10 adjacent parcels of land to put in a new subdivision and you rush in and buy one of them in hopes that you will be able to resell it to your own client at an elevated price when you're the only parcel that they need at the end that they don't have yet. And so that would be something that would be advantageous to you, but disadvantageous to your client. That's the classic scenario under 1.8b. So let's move on. Comment 5 continues, 
The rule does not prohibit uses that do not disadvantage the client. And in this respect, Rule 1.8b differs somewhat from um, fiduciary and agency laws, which um, uh, if you have a fiduciary rule, uh, under fiduciary law, they may say that you can't act to your own advantage uh, no matter what. Um, but And then here's another example that they give in comment five of something that's permissible, and this is what you should keep in mind as the right answer on the MPRE. A lawyer who learns of a government agency's interpretation of trade legislation during the representation of one client may properly use that information um, for the benefit of other clients. I, I hope that seems obvious to you. The, when you learn something from every case you work on, that's why experienced lawyers can charge a higher billable rate. They're more knowledgeable and they can work more efficiently. They know what they're doing. They can see how uh, put uh, the context uh, for a case and they don't have a learning curve anymore. So all of the things you learn while you're working on one case will be helpful and make you better at representing your future clients, hopefully. And there's no problem with that under this rule. Comment five then starts to um, talk about uh, some specifics. Remember that paragraph B prohibits disadvantageous use of the client information unless the client gives informed consent. Um, so this means because of this, uh, um, courts uh, usually require showing proof of client harm in order to enforce 1.8b as a disciplinary rule. In other words, it, the, un, the, under the wording of 1.8b, it doesn't the lawyer's not subject to discipline if it's not to the disadvantage of the client. And let's compare this and contrast it with some other rules. 1.8b governs the use of information in contrast to disclosure, which is governed by 1.6, our general confidentiality duty. And so notice that the, the phrase in the rule is use the information, like act on it, whether you reveal the information to other people. Also, 1.8b relates to current clients. Once the client-lawyer relationship has ended, Rule 1.9, which is about former clients, governs both the disclosure and use of protected client information. And I, I got to tell you that in practice, this is more common, that lawyers misuse information from former clients. Most lawyers don't want to harm someone that they're currently representing. So let's talk about another difference between 1.8b and 1.9. 1.8b applies even to client information that may otherwise be publicly available. In other words, generally known. Although this is rare in practice, usually we're talking about confidential information. But under Model Rule 1.9, that's an exception for generally known information. So generally known information is not part of the definition of confidential information for either present or past clients under Model Rule 1.9. B. That's a really important distinction between 1.8b and 1.9. Also keep in mind that rule 1.7 often applies even if another conflict of interest rule applies. So 1.7 could also cover using generally known information to the detriment of a current client, um, whether to further a personal interest of the lawyer or to further the interest of another client. Misuse of information, though, is more common, as I said, with former clients. Okay. This means that if you are disciplined by the state bar for violating 1.8b, there's a good chance they will also um, say that you violated 1.7. One last uh, thing to watch out for here. Lawyers um, have been disciplined following a criminal conviction for insider trading. That's using confidential information that's not available to the public to make uh, um, trades, sales and purchases of publicly traded stock that, because you know the price is about to go up or down before anyone else does. And you can go to jail for that. Um, and if you are convicted, whether you go to jail or not, if you are convicted, um, you uh, are likely to also be disciplined under 1.8. So I don't want to get too far afield uh, outside of the scope of this course into insider trading which is really under securities regulations. But also keep in mind that in those cases, in insider trading cases, because we have such a clear statutory prohibition, courts often don't really um, require 
a showing that the client was harmed in order to find the the lawyer misused client information and should be subject to discipline. Here's a quick review question to see if you've been paying attention for the last few minutes. If a lawyer learns that a client's business is secretly planning to acquire another company that's in financial distress, can the lawyer tip off other clients that it would be a good time to invest in that struggling business that's basically about to be rescued? A, yes, unless the client has forbidden this, or B, no, unless a client first consents. I hope you know the answer to that. If you don't, you might not have been paying attention and you should rewatch this short video. And that concludes our brief lecture about ABA Model Rule 1.8b. Stay tuned for our next lecture on 1.8c, which is about lawyers who receive gifts from their clients.